Good morning all. Thank you for attending today's session, which will be going over ratios. So just as for the format of the session, if you joined the first one, you're probably aware of this, but if you didn't, not a problem. Um, so for the format of the session, we'll run through a number of tasks and I will explain how some of the different ratios work. Um, we'll explain each part and how to calculate them. And then we'll record the session. So we'll send this out to you after. And if you've got any questions at the end, obviously, please do ask. OK, so what we'll do is we'll just swap over now to our other screen and we'll start going through each task uh, ratio by ratio and hopefully build some understanding for each of these. Excellent. Right. OK, so let's have a look at task one. So what we'll do is for this one, it just says give the correct formula for the following ratios. So what we'll do is we'll work through each one and we'll just have a little bit of a chat about what they mean and how they're calculated. So the first one we've got is return on capital employed. And to work this out, all we do is take our operating profit and divide it by our capital employed. So let's get that in. Apologize now for my handwriting. OK, so our capital or return on capital employed effectively shows us how much operating profit we've generated from our capital employed. Now, just to confirm, just in case anyone's unaware, our capital employed is our equity plus our non-current liabilities. So it's effectively how we finance the business. So we've got, as we know, shares that we can use to finance certain activities, and we've got non-current liabilities. Now, just be aware it is just non-current liabilities. It doesn't include current liabilities. So realistically, we're talking about stuff such as loans that we would use to help finance the activities of the business. Okay, so for this particular ratio, the higher the better, because what it does show is that the business is effectively producing or gaining more profit for the amount of capital that they have within the business. So for this one, really important to note, the higher, the better. So the next one on our list is our trade payables collection period. And to calculate that, it would be our trade payables over the cost of sales, multiplied by 365. So let's get that in. So effectively, what this one shows is how long, on average, it takes us to pay our suppliers. So in terms of where we want this one, i.e. higher or lower, it's actually sort of neither really for this one. It's somewhere in the middle. So we don't want this to be too high because we don't want to be taking so long to take our suppliers that they could either cut us off as a business or that we end up with quite a bad reputation as someone who's slow to, to pay. Equally, we don't want it too low either. I mean, if if it's a catch, if it's a sorry, if it's a cash rich business and it's not a huge problem, then if it's a bit lower, it doesn't matter. But equally, we want to be utilizing our credit terms. So if we've got thirty days to pay, realistically, we could take up to that long without it being an issue. So make sure we use that to the best or to our advantage really. So we don't want this too high and we don't want it too low either. So the next one on the list is our asset turnover using non-current asset registers. And the formula for this is operating profit over non-current assets. And just to confirm, <clears throat> that would be the carrying value. So just get that in.
So this one, again, the higher, the better, because what we're saying is the higher this ratio is, the higher the operating profit we're generating through the use of our non-current assets. So like I say, the higher for that one, the better. Just shows that we're utilizing our non-current assets efficiently in order to generate profit. So the next one on the list is our trade receivables collection period, which is simply your trade receivables figure over your sales revenue times by 365. So whenever we're, whenever we're multiplying by 365, we should get a figure in days. So let's just get that formula in. So trade receivables. Over sales revenue. Good type. Times three six five. So on this one, ideally we want this as low as possible because what we're testing here is how quickly we're getting our money in from our customers. So obviously the quicker they pay, the better, because that means we actually have that money in the bank available to use. So on that one, the lower, the better. The next one we have on our list then is inventory holding period. And again, this one is in days. So the formula for this one would be our inventory figure. And when I say inventory for all of these, we are referring just to say the closing inventory figure over our cost of sales multiplied by 365. So again, we'll get this in days. That's inventory. Over cost of sales. Times 365. And again, on this one, actually, the lower, the better, really, because if we think about what this is testing, which is how long we have our inventory on average for, literally in the name, how, how long we hold on to it, that generally would cost the business more money, because obviously, the, the longer we hold on to it, you've got stuff like holding costs, so warehouse costs, potentially security costs as well, so that the longer we hold that, that generally the worse it would be. And obviously the quicker we can get inventory in and out the door, gen generally you would expect that to increase the, the working capital cycle, which we'll come on to in, in a second. I.e. we're buying inventory in, selling it on, making a profit, getting that money in so we can buy more inventory. So that the quicker we can do that and the less days we hold on to the inventory, generally we would expect that to be better for the business. So the last one on our list is the working capital cycle. So this would be our inventory days plus the receivable days minus payable days. So let's just get that in. Oh, hang on a minute, we flip down here. It's all right, preview, little preview there. Inventory. Plus see all days minus payable days. So I sort of mentioned this previously when talking about the inventory holding days. But the quicker we can get around this cycle, the better, because generally, if we can get around this cycle quicker, the more profit, the more money that the business would generate. If we're thinking about buying inventory in, selling it, getting the money in from customers and paying off our suppliers, the quicker we can get around that cycle, the more money that we should make. 
Excellent. So that covers task one. Let's now move on to task two. So Irving Limited has revenue for the year end of 31st of December of 1.54 million. Its cost of sales for the same period were 635,000 and other operating expenses were 742,000. The total equity of the business was 3.4 million and non-current liabilities were 288,000. Calculate the following to two decimal places. So we've got gross profit percentage, operating profit percentage, and return on capital employed. So we have just seen the formulas for these, but let's now get them into practice. So the first one we've got on the list is gross profit percentage. Now, in this particular scenario, you may have noticed that it doesn't actually give you gross profit. So the first step here will be to actually calculate our gross profit, which is done by taking our revenue, and taking off cost of sales. So we have revenue, 1.54 million. Less cost of sales, 635,000. Will give us a gross profit of 905,000. So from this, we can now work out our gross profit percentage, which we should know from just speaking about it on the previous task, is our gross profit figure over revenue multiplied by 100. So if we do that, we should have 905,000 over our revenue, 1.54 million, multiplied by 100 to give us a gross profit percentage, 58.77%. So it does say within this question as well, calculate the following to two decimal places. So we've got 58.77. Right, the next one on the list then is our operating profit percentage. So to calculate this, all we do is take our operating profit and divide it by our revenue and multiply it by 100. Now to get our operating profit, it would just be our sales, less cost of sales, i.e. giving us our gross profit. And then we also take off our operating expenses and this will give you your operating profit. So that will be, let's just change color so we can easily see, would be, can we take our gross profit or we can do from the start, that's fine. Do one, 0.54 million. So our revenue, less cost of sales, 635,000, less our operating expenses of 742,000. And that gives us a operating profit of 163,000. And from there, we can now work out our operating profit percentage, which is just our operating profit over revenue multiplied by 100. So that would be 163,000 over our revenue of 1.54 million times 100. to give us a percentage of 10.58. You can get that in. Excellent. 
Excellent. Right. Now, the next one is our return on capital employed. OK, change colour again so you can see what we're doing. And to get this, we should know again from going over it in task one that the formula should be our operating profit over our capital employed, with our capital employed being the total equity plus our non-current liabilities. So we know what our operating profit is because we've just calculated that. So for capital employed, it would be our operating profit of 163,000 divided by our capital employed, so total equity, which is our 3.4 million up here, plus our non-current non liabilities of 288,000. So it would be, just put this in brackets so we can see how this is calculated. Okay, so it's 163,000, as I said, divided by our 3.4 million plus 288,000. Okay, which gives us, to multiply that by 100 as well to change that into a percentage. Gives us a percentage of 4.42%. And we can get that in. Excellent. And that covers task two. We can move on now and have a look at task three. So you'll see for task three, we have been given a statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income and a statement of financial position. And what we will have to do, there will be a little bit of scrolling involved here. We're, we need to calculate the following ratios to two decimal places. So the first one on the list is the current ratio. And we calculate the current ratio by doing our current assets over current liabilities. So let's just go back up to our profit or loss and same in a financial position. So the figures we're focusing on here, as I said, are the current assets and current liabilities. So we've got the current assets, as I've just highlighted. and the current liabilities, which are just down at the bottom. So we've got our trade payables figure and tax liability. Okay. So with those in mind, let's get this noted down. So for the current ratio, do current assets And our figure and we want to divide that by our current liabilities which was our trade payables and tax liability added together so divide by current liabilities which add together with an eight. And 
And if we divide the current assets by the current liabilities, that would give us a ratio of 1.16. OK, so what we're saying is there that we have enough assets to cover our current liabilities. That does involve inventory, which we should or possibly know that we that does mean that we'd have to sell that off um, in order to actually current in order to cover our current liabilities. So that is an important factor just to consider. However, it is over one. Uh, the ratio, which is a good sign, and um, we want that at least over one. But the thing just to focus on, as I said, is, is that does include our inventory figure, which could be problematic, particularly if the business does have high inventory, because unless we can sell that off, we don't actually have the cash in order to uh, pay off our liabilities. Now, Following on from that, this is where the, the sort of real test comes in, where we look at the quick ratio, or often known as the acid test, because this is very similar to our current ratio, except that we don't include our inventory. So if I just go back up to our statement of financial position, we will focus on our current assets, as I said, not including inventory. So it would be the trade receivables and cash and cash equivalents divided by your current liabilities. So let's get that in. So this is your, oh, I'm not doing it. So this will be your current assets. less inventory. Which comes to 2,110,000. Okay, we are working in thousands here, so it'll just show us 2,110, but that is in thousands. That's divided by our current liabilities. which gives us a ratio of 0.68. Now, let's just get that in. Now, that is a concern, okay, because this, because this is below one, as this is below a one-to-one -one ratio, what we're saying is, ignoring inventory, we don't actually have enough money as a business to cover our short-term or current liabilities. That obviously is a problem from a liquidity perspective. So that if that if that was the case, that would definitely be a concern for the business because we would still want to see that above one. OK, so the next one is our inventory holding days, which we know from task one is our inventory over cost of sales. So let's go back up to our statement of financial position. And we want to be looking at our inventory figure and our cost of sales figure. Okay. So that wants to be inventory. over cost of sales. Multiplied by 365. So remember, we want this in days. 
And that gives us 47.03 days. Okay, it does say to calculate these to two decimal places, but just be aware if it doesn't say to calculate them to two decimal places, with it being in days, I would just do it to a full number of days. So we've got, but with this saying to two decimal places, we'll put it to two decimal places. Okay, so that comes out 47.03 days. Now, the next one on our list is our gearing ratio. And although there are two ways of calculating the gearing ratio, there's realistically only one that generally gets tested within the exam, and that is debt divided by debt plus equity. And when we're referring to debt, we are on about our non-current liabilities. Okay, so to calculate this one, let's just jump back up to our statement of financial position. So here you can see that we have our non-current liabilities of 3,525,000. And our equity figure of 8,322,000. So to calculate this, it would be debt over debt plus equity. And again, just to, just to reiterate, this is just your non-current liabilities. Tell times 100. Which gives us 29.75%. Okay, now that is not a bad percentage at all for your gearing ratio. Anything below 50%, or including 50% is what we would probably consider as low risk. Because what we're saying is as a percentage of total amount of financing, i.e. debt and equity, the actual debt part is quite low. Okay, remember that for equity, we're only having to pay dividends out to shareholders after profits, whereas debt, okay, i.e. you know, your loans etc has to be paid out regardless so the higher that percentage is the higher risk it is to the business and although it, it could be suitable for some businesses so i'm not i'm not sort of writing it all off for everyone but for most businesses we would hope to see that at 50 percent or below okay so the next formula on this list that we need to look at is the return on shareholder funds, which is your profit from continuing operations. So let's just get these highlighted. Run out of colours here, but it is our return. So profit from continuing operations over equity which we already have highlighted in red, but it is double highlighted now. So let's get that in. So for return on shareholder funds, it is profit
from continuing operations four million nine hundred and ten thousand over equity. Eight million three hundred and twenty two thousand times by hundred and that is at fifty nine percent. Okay, so the higher the better for this one. Okay, two decimal places will put point zero zero. The higher, higher the better, really, for this one. Um, obviously, what, what that's saying is that we've created more profit uh, from the available shareholder funds. The more profit we have, the better, because that can then be distributed to our shareholders. And the last one on this list is our inventory turnover. We've run out of colours now, so we'll go back to green. So to calculate our inventory turnover, it is simply our cost of sales over inventory figure. So we'll flip back to here. So we've got our inventory, which was highlighted in blue on our statement of financial position. It's you 1,453,000. Uh, okay, and our cost of sales figure, 11,277,000. So it's just the cost of sales cost of sales divided by inventory. which comes out to 7.76. Just going to put that in. Okay, the higher the better here, the more chance that we've got of generating money. So effectively, the higher this is, the better it should be. Okay then, so moving on to task four now so we've got jcd limited manufactures uh, is a manufacturing machinery used in the construction industry you've been asked to use the extract of the financial statements of the company's main competitor and compare the results so on this one we're effectively comparing between two different businesses and it wants us to calculate the different ratios and compare them. Okay, so we'll go through these relatively quickly now. Okay, just due to time, and I just want to make sure that we get to look at some of the analysis as well. So gross profit percentage and operating profit percentage will form the same as what we've done in the previous um, previous questions that we've completed. So I'm not going to run through the calculations for those specifically. Um, we'll just get those in. So we've got, if we just go back up, okay, so we know that this is gross profit over revenue times 100, and that calculates to be 63.2 percent okay operating profit okay is our profit from operations okay over 
uh, sales revenue. Which works out to be twelve point six percent return on capital employed. It will sometimes show as R O C E gain operating profit over capital employed. Remember that capital employed is your equity. plus your non-current liabilities. Which comes out to be 10.1%. Current ratio, your current assets over current liabilities. So your current liabilities here. You've got again trade payables and tax liability. Current assets, you have inventory and trade receivables. And that calculates to being 2.1. Over one. The acid test then is our current assets less inventory. So in this instance, it is your trade receivables figure over your current liabilities. So again, trade payables and tax liability. And that works out to be 1.1 over 1. Next, inventory holding days. It's our inventory over cost of sales. So you've got your inventory, again, just here. Which is your four million and fifty five thousand over your cost of sales, which is shown here, and that works out to be a hundred and six days. Next on the list, then, we have our trade receivables days, which is just our trade receivables over our sales revenue figure. So our trade receivables here, 4,545,000. Over the sales revenue of 38 million. So that works out to be 44 days. And your working capital cycle is then just your inventory days plus receivable days, less payable days which comes out to 67 days. Okay, now I'm hoping for the actual ratios and the calculations, you are fairly comfortable uh, with those now. The bit that I sort of wanted to concentrate on more is just having a look a little bit at the analysis of these ratios. So some of the questions that you may get asked within an exam. 
So let's have a look at each of these. So it says for this, based on the scorecard above, i.e. what we've just completed, select the correct assumptions for the following. So for profitability, it says, or these are our options. The gross profit and operating profit percentages are better for the competitor. This indicates that the competitor has a better use of the working capital cycle. Okay, well, let's just have a quick look. Okay, so our gross profit is better. Okay, that is true. But our operating profit is lower for the competitor. Okay, you'll see that the gross profit is 63.2%, which is higher, but the operating profit is 12.6%, which is lower. So that would be incorrect. It then says the return on capital employed of the competitor in comparison to JCD Limited indicates that the competitor is using its working capital more effectively. So let's just go and have a look at the return on capital employed. Well, actually, as we can see, the return on capital employed for the competitor is lower at 10.1% than it is for JCD Limited, which is 12.9%. Okay, just underline that for you there. Okay, so therefore, the return on capital employed is actually lower, and therefore that would be also incorrect. The last one then says the overall profitability of JCD Limited is better than the competitor. Although the gross profit percentage is slightly higher for the competitor, JCD Limited may have lower operating costs and uses its working capital more efficiently. I mean, with this being the third option, you would hope this has been correct, but let's just confirm that. Okay, so, apologies. So the overall profitability is better for JCD because the operating profit percentage, which is here, is higher than the competitor. So it then says, although the gross profit percentage is slightly higher for the competitor, which it is, JCD may have lower operating costs and uses its working capital more efficiently. Well, the working capital cycle down here is lower, which is a good thing. OK, and the operating profit is higher. OK, so that would be correct. Okay, we then have the liquidity. So it says the first option, the liquidity of the competitor is better. This indicates that the company has a good short term solvency. So let's have a look at the liquidity. So this wouldn't be correct because actually the competitor has a lower current ratio and is lower for the acid test as well. So that would actually be incorrect. The next option is then the liquidity of JCD Limited is better. The current ratio indicates that the company has enough current assets to cover its current liabilities. The quick ratio or acid test is a better test of liquidity as it shows the immediate solvency of a company because inventories are less liquid. Well, that we know, because we've just had a look at these, is true, okay, because we have a better acid test ratio, okay, and it is a better test of liquidity because it doesn't include the inventory figure. So that would be true okay we'll just make sure that the last one is false so it says the current ratio of both companies is a cause for concern and should be below one to one which is also the industry average okay well we know that that's not true because they're both above one to one 
So we know that's false. Right, Ooh. apologies. So just these two more, and that will wrap up the session. So the working capital cycle, it says the working capital cycle for the competitor is considerably better than JCD. This could be due to the better inventory holding days. Well, having a look, the working capital cycle is actually worse for the competitor because it takes longer, 67 days in comparison to 57 days. So that would definitely be false. The working capital cycle for JCD is better than the competitor. We know that that bit's true. This indicates that the amount of time between paying for materials and receiving the cash for goods sold is quicker than that of the competitor. This could be due to a better inventory holding period. So let's just have a quick look. Okay, well, the inventory holding period is also lower than the competitor, which is a good thing. And as we've previously said, the working capital cycle is also better because it's lower. So that would be correct. Let's just check the last one is false. So the competitor has a better working capital cycle of 21 days. This indicates that the competitor make, is making better use of its resources and has a better turnaround of its inventory. Okay, well, it's not than 21 days. We can certainly say that because there's only a 10 day difference. So that would be false. The very last one then is the overall performance. So the first statement says the overall performance of the competitor is better than JCD. This indicates that JCD Limited should reduce its selling prices to gain more customers. So I think we can all agree that the competitor is not doing overall better than JCD due to the fact that it has a lower operating profit and a lower return on capital employed. So it has lower on both of these two. So I would say straight away that it is not performing better. So that one would be false. The overall performance of the competitor is significantly worse than JCD. The current ratio shows serious concern for uh, liquidity. Now, that is quite an extreme statement because for the competitor, both current ratio and acid tests are over one. So I wouldn't say there's serious concern um, liquidity wise. I would just say that it doesn't perform quite as well as JCD. So I would also say that one was false. So the last one is true then. So the overall performance of the competitor is slightly worse than JCD, which I think we would all agree that that is the case. It says, whilst this is good, there are limitations on accuracy of the ratios as we can only assume what has affected these. JCD Limited should still attempt to improve its ratio, to improve its ratios and complete another comparison or review in the near future to identify any significant changes, which will always be the case. You do, you wouldn't do, uh, you, you wouldn't calculate your ratios and then just leave them. It's not a one-off thing. It is a continuous check on a business's performance. So that one is true. Excellent. So that wraps up our tasks and our session. We'll just open it up now. And just if anyone has any questions, please do ask. And I do apologize that we've uh, that we've gone over slightly on time. Just share, stop sharing the screen. And again, thank you for attending. Um, I hope you have found it useful. Any questions that come to you, like I say, even after, after watching the session back, feel free to just pop them through. Um, and, and again, thank you. Thank you for attending.